We are in rapt attention. We are waiting with bated breath on the results of what will happen with the United States House of Representatives. We also, if we are engaged in the election, or certainly if we live in Georgia, are not merely waiting, but engaging for a month to determine whether there will need to be a power sharing agreement, whether there will need to be uh, the ability for either Joe Manchin or Kristen Sinema to determine what happens with the U.S. Senate, with any judicial appointment, for instance, we're waiting on, not merely waiting, we're engaging around an election in December in Georgia. We want to get to the bottom of that. And to help us get to the bottom of that, we have the inimitable Adam Green, co-founder of the Progressive Change Campaign Committee. You can check their website out at boldprogressives.org. And Adam Green, I believe, is with us right now. Adam, how you doing, sir? Doing well. Great to uh, hear your voice again, Jefferson. Been a, been a while. It's been Thanks too long. It. I blame myself and partially you. So, yeah. the uh, so how, what has surprised <laughs> you most? What has surprised you most about this election? Were you one of the folks who felt that the sky was, if not falling, cracking, or were you one of the folks who saw competing competing waves cresting together? Where, where were you at prior to the election? Well, prior to the election, you know, whenever anyone asked me how I was doing, I would always have to caveat it by saying, with the exception of the existential dread, I feel for our democracy, I'm doing okay. <laughs> and I feel like I can remove that now. I really, the thing that surprised me most in a pleasant way is the uprising among regular Americans who really understood that through some combination of abortion rights and cancel student debt and a general a general sense of many rights being taken away from us and things not being normal, everyday people who might not normally vote in midterms came out to save our democracy. And I'll, I'll say that our organization was very involved in secretary of state races, and we've had a clean sweep so far. Every single swing state Democrat running for secretary of state has won who is running against an election denier, and that literally helps me sleep better at night. So now we're, now we're turning to Congress, but I'm feeling a little bit better about the state of our democracy, including the people who rose up to defend it. So in the run-up to the election, New York Times was saying there's going to be, you know, the only question is it, how big a red wave is going to be and, and if it's big enough to actually call it a wave or just a big... Republican win. And after their analysis was, well, it was two things. It was democracy and it was abortion. Those are the two things. And where uh, you had, uh, where you had governors on the ballot who would determine the fate of abortion in their state and or even election deniers on the ballot, uh, that seemed to predict how well uh, Republicans did. How much do you endorse that analysis or what does that analysis miss? So I wouldn't I wouldn't pin it on any any one or two things. Although I think abortion was a major factor in the mix for a lot of people. I think it was kind of a proxy for this larger sense again that our fundamental rights are being taken away from us and more will be taken away including the right to have a democracy, to have the will of the people prevail if we don't show up and vote. Uh, I think I think that so again whether you call that voting on democracy or just this gut level visceral sense that something is very wrong, I need to defend my country, you know, that swirl of stuff really helped. And, you know, when it comes to young people, the most reliable age bracket for Democrats was under 30 year olds um, who delivered by, I think it was a net 28 points for, for Democrats. You know, canceling student debt was a very bold thing for the president to do, uh, answering the call that Elizabeth Warren issued uh, many, many months ago. And hopefully um, the, the signal sent by voters and the lesson learned by Democrats is we're going in the right direction. Let's be bolder and move quicker. Uh, that's my that's my short short take on what's going on here. So, and yeah, I, I, I wanted to look up who whose take it was. That I really appreciate it, but it overlaps with yours. That it wasn't merely the magic. It included the magic. It wasn't merely the magic of of um, a particular issue, but that combination woke people up to, wait a minute, there's some real threat. There are things that are in question that I never really thought were in question, right? I, I really sort of took Roe versus Wade for granted. I'm not saying I did, but there were, you know, there were voters in the world who did. I uh, thought that, okay, yeah, Democrats are probably to fight over stuff, but overall things will kind of work out. And there was sort of folks woke up. And, and that's sort of your take as I'm, 
as I'm hearing it. Were there any results that particularly surprised you, either at the individual race level or in the more macro level? Yeah, the individual race level, uh, I was very happy that Catherine Cortez Masto won. I think it was kind of 50-50 or 60-40, you know, if you could get a bet on that race. But I think the conventional wisdom in D.C. chatter was that if one incumbent was going to lose, it would be her. So it's fitting that her race being called signals that we now have 50 votes and Georgia is now about the 51st vote. Um, you know, Warnock, I I wouldn't call it surprising, but it was it was we all knew it was going to be close and it was close, but it was great that he won. If there's one thing that I actually am surprised by, uh, if Kerry Lake loses in uh, Arizona for governor, that would be a very, very pleasant surprise. I think the conventional wisdom was that she was a popular local uh, TV anchor, and even though she had crazy extremist views and likely would be a Republican rising star if she won, uh, that um, most people would put her views aside because they've liked her for 20 years or whatever on TV. And so far, Katie Hobbs is in the lead and the votes that are coming in seem to be going her direction. So that would be probably the biggest one I'd identify as a potential upset. You know, if Lauren Boebert loses, I don't think she will. But if she did, that would be another you know, big, big upset in our favor. Where are we in the House? It seems like the, I mean, the, the conventional wisdom, you know, I don't know, five days ago was that, yeah. well, the right now the U.S. Senate's a toss-up and the Republicans are going to win the House by a smaller margin than anticipated. Now Democrats are holding the uh, Senate by a whisker and whether they'll actually have control beyond Kamala Harris's control will be determined in Georgia. And the House, I would say still, I mean, it'd be a, it, it'll be a, lots of, uh, lots of, late counted votes or after the election counted votes that will tilt things, but the House hasn't been called and there's a chance. Do you still think there's a meaningful chance for Democrats to hold the House? What are you still looking at? I would call it a, a small but meaningful chance. Yeah. Whether you want to call it a 10% chance or a 15 or 20% chance. I mean, it would, it would need various votes that have yet to be counted to go in our direction. And I think what, you know, the bean counter, the data, the data people who have been looking at votes coming in are saying is that so far the trend lines are not going in the direction of us having pretty much a clean sweep of all the remaining house races. I think there were a dozen or so that were in the air and we were able to lose only two of them and we lost one already. So we basically have, you know, one more to spare and if yeah. we lose two or more. Yeah. That, that being said, let me let me offer a possibly original take that I hope becomes the conventional wisdom soon, if I may. Sure. Yeah. You know, if if Democrats lose the House, um, I believe Joe Manchin will be responsible for that on multiple fronts. Uh, you're saying actually, if Democrats lose the House, you think I'm Joe sorry, Manchin, yeah. is that what you said? Will be responsible for handing the House to Republicans okay. on multiple fronts. All right. I mean, first of all, I mean, there's kind of a self-admission. When Chuck Todd asked him a couple months before the election, do you want Democrats to win the House and the Senate? He dodged and said, you know, whatever the voters decide. Yeah. But more concretely, you know, what Steve Kornacki was saying on, saying on MSNBC and kind of the conventional wisdom on election night was that, uh, Republicans needed to pick up five house, five house seats, and due to gerrymandering, they pretty much wrote themselves five house seats. Meaning, even if there was zero wave, zero ripples, zero drops of red, still they would win five house seats just because of gerrymandering. Well, there was a bill on the table at the start of this new this recent Congress called the For the People Act that would have expressly addressed gerrymandering and undid what ended up happening in states like Florida with extreme Republican partisan gerrymandering. Joe Manchin knew the stakes, and he stood in the way and blocked this bill from becoming law. In addition, he blocked the Democratic economic agenda for an entire year. The, the intent when it was offered and what you know what was supposed to be passed in summer of 2021 was that it would be taking effect and felt tangibly in people's lives by election day at 2022. Well, by delaying it a year, we were able to say we did good things, but people weren't feeling it. They weren't feeling lower prescription prices. Yep. They weren't feeling lower health healthcare prices. Yep. You know, cancel student debt was actually delayed pending that first bill. So people weren't feeling that yet, but they were feeling gas prices. And, and there were frontline battleground House candidates who said in the Washington Post, I'm trying to campaign on this economic agenda, but people aren't feeling it yet. And it's making my job harder. So on two fronts, by blocking democracy uh, legislation and by delaying the democratic economic uh, legislation being felt, I think Joe Manchin really handed Republicans the House, and that is tragic. The I, I it occurred to me on the 
on like the HR1 related stuff, on the democracy reform related stuff, uh, it hadn't occurred to me on impacting actually people's economic lives and changing the economic discussion, you know, not only trying to hustle it, as you said, with words, but actually how people are feeling about it. I hadn't thought sufficiently about that. The, uh, uh, but you wouldn't, it, let me say this before we go to break. Picking one thing is a tough thing to do, right? Because I've got people who are saying, well, if Kurt Schrader wouldn't have been primaried in Oregon, maybe he would have held his seat, and that one seat would have done it, right? If New York hadn't changed how they district, or California uh, didn't change how they district, if they had district in a more partisan fashion, they district like Texas and Florida did, then Democrats would do it. I want to stick with the mansion thing, though, because I think it's kind of interesting. We're talking to Adam Green, who's had both a bird's eye and a detailed look at a bunch of these races. Your hot take for today is that Joe, maybe not just for today, but certainly shared just now, is that Joe Manchin is to blame for the Democrats not winning the House, or at least not winning it if they don't win and not winning it by a more comfortable margin, because he didn't support democracy reforms, because he didn't come out and say, I want Democrats to win, and because he uh, didn't help the Democratic economic agenda happen when it would have had time for people to feel it. What turns on that, right? I mean, I, Joe Manchin still has the highest, probably, if one's a sports fan, the highest replacement value, right, of anybody else, right? It's not, Joe Manchin's, a Democrat's not holding West Virginia, right? Like, if it's not Joe Manchin, it's going to be Republican, and, and that person would still do all the things you said, plus more or worse. But what turns on us understanding uh, sort of Manchin's role in this? Well, first of all, I'm not arguing for Joe Manchin losing to a Republican. I'm, I'm arguing for Joe Manchin to do better including do better by the people of West Virginia. Yeah. You know, it, just one small irony, you know, during the heyday of the Build Back Better agenda, um, you know, Bernie Sanders had been proposing that Medicare cover uh, dental, vision, and hearing. And there was some study that came out that said that of all the 50 states, the people with the worst teeth happened to be people in West Virginia, statistically. That would have helped people of West Virginia, but Joe Manchin put the kibosh on that, right? There are many examples like that where it wasn't that he was fighting for his constituents. He was fighting for his corporate donors yeah. and doing whatever random things he's doing that make Lindsey Graham happy and make him feel good in the beltway. But he wasn't advocating for those people. Um, I think to give him some credit way back in the day, he was a champion for social security. And I hope he reclaims that mantle of being an economic populist and stops going down this route where he feels like he needs to negotiate with insurrectionists and do the bidding of Wall Street. That's really hurt him and hurt Democrats. You know, to your question before, you know, when I was in law school, there was this phrase we learned, you know, is something a but for cause? Right. But for this, this wouldn't have happened. But yeah. for this. So I think that there's several but for causes, but at least two of them were Joe Manchin's. You know, had he allowed the democracy bill to have passed, we would have a Democratic House. There was no doubt about it because they're, you know, they flipped five seats that way and will likely be behind like three or four. Um, but for him allowing the economic bill to pass in its entirety or even what we did pass a year earlier, uh, people who were feeling the pain of gas prices would have also had more money in their pockets due to all the other things that we got them that will now come into effect in 2023. So, yes, also New York Democrats messed up, and that's unfortunate. On the Kurt Schrader front, I just want to push back against that. Jamie McLeod Skinner ran an amazing race, and Kurt Schrader, instead of being a team player, you know, he's a corporate Democrat, there forever. Democrats across the country had to support him because he was the nominee. He refused to endorse the Democratic nominee gave outwardly hurtful, damaging statements to the press. And then the party apparatus really didn't support her, thinking she would get blown out. And instead, she's probably going to lose by a point or two. And that is just, you know, we can't have a, a new normal where corporate Democrats lose primaries and take their ball and go home. Uh, but progressives lose primaries sometimes and are team players. We all have to be team players. And again, we would have had that seat, had that corporate Democrat got along and, and had the establishment gotten her back the way they put money into other races where we probably lost by 10 points. No, I, I appreciate the pushback and, I, and, and I'm and i a, I'm a Jane McLeod Skinner uh, fan and, and know her a little bit. The, uh, uh, I still, is it your take, we'll have to take it after the break, that Joe Manchin misreads what he has to do politically to stay elected as Democrat and Republican voting state in modern world, uh, or that we're just frustrated with what that means now. In the middle of brisk democracy autumn, what have we learned 
What do we need to do next? What do the did wells and do differently? We're talking to Adam Green with Progressive Change Committee. The uh, Adam, what are things you think this election that pro democracy forces, progressive forces, you pick the word you want and they're different. Uh, what do you think was done well? What heartened you in terms of the run up to the election? You know, I think Democrats' willingness to call out the idea that there were genuine threats to democracy was done well. And I know that Joe Biden gave a speech about a week before the election that took some criticism. Why are you talking about this? And I think that was, you know, not the totality of, you know, I think I think it was uh, tip of the iceberg of Democrats across the country saying this is not normal. We will lose our democracy if these people don't don't um, if our side doesn't win. And what that means for you is we might lose our planet. <laughs> we might lose more rights along the lines of abortion. And we need pe good people to step up now. I think that that, you know, kind of primal scream uh, from the electorate and from Democratic candidates running against these insurrectionist and insurrectionist adjacent people really was was a game changer. You know, I think abortion happened to us. And thankfully, Democrats were very clear that that was something that we we're going to try to rectify. Um, so, you know, I'm very I'm very glad that we didn't go with a minimalist playbook. Uh, it was nice to see Democrats not running away from the bold things that happened during the first two years of the Biden agenda, including canceling student debt. I mean, directionally, we were all kind of running in the same direction. And fortunately, we were able to kind of underscore the existential stakes of this election. That's that's what I think we did well. And we need to keep doing well if we're up against Trump or Trumpism in 2024. Flipping, what do you think we need to do differently? What do you think, are you could call it Democrats or you, know, you could call it activists. What needs to be happen, what needs to happen better? Yeah, you know, it's a complicated question, but maybe not. What, one thing that strikes me is that by having such a long debate about the president's economic agenda, much of it behind the scenes, we really weren't expressing our values. You know, um, there were months of public negotiations with Joe Manchin, but then when he kind of pulled the, the plug on the economic bill from basically December through July or so, uh, the word had gone out, and you know we have a very robust government relations operation. We confirmed this, you know, right from members of Congress. The word had gone out: we are not negotiating in public. We're not talking about anything in the economic bill in public. Well, what did that mean? That meant mean we had a, a seven-month blackout, talking about, you know, from talking about child care, from talking about the child tax credit, from talking about home care for the elderly, from talking about Medicare expansion. I'm talking about Medicaid expansion, talking about why we're trying to put more money in people's pockets, right? And then surprise, surprise, come the week before the election or two weeks before the election, there's all this polling showing that people trust Republicans more than Democrats on the economy. That's that's unnecessary. We need to be out there every day, every week, expressing our values, not trimming our sails for Joe Manchin. And then the second thing is we need Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema to get in line because what they were doing was not popular back home or popular with anybody. I mean, we won despite what they did, not because they in some way moderated the party. And again, it's tragic that the impact of our economic agenda was not felt in time for the election day. I think we would have 52 or more seats in the Senate, a robust Democratic majority, if people were feeling the economic benefit that we actually just passed but that only is gonna come into fruition in a few months. So I think we need to talk about our values more and just get in line and pass stuff so that people are feeling the impact by election day, 2024. What do you, what do you think the key next steps now? If you're facing a, and maybe you'll have to do this in a couple different scenarios, but let, let's assume now, let's have it be surprising good news maybe. It, it, assuming we're in a place where Republicans control the House by a razor thin margin. If you want to give the contraposite, that's fine. Democrats hold the Senate by a razor thin margin, and Joe Biden is president. What do you think needs to happen? I hesitate to use the word realistically, but I did just use that word uh, in, in any lame duck session. And what do you think needs to happen in this you know, next 100 days, next year? Yeah. Well, first, if there are any corporate executives listening to this program right now, I would consider, I would ask you to consider hiring a couple of the House Republicans, all you need is two, maybe three, to flip control of the House. <laughs> uh, do it before January 3rd, please. Um, that would be nice. Uh, <laughs> That's one of the questions, by the way. One of the questions that came is we had, what, 16, uh, 16 um, uh, ultimate vacancies in the House in the, in the 117th Congress, whatever it was. Uh, yes. And 
if, if we have like three resignations, right, and somebody yeah. different wins, do they have to reorganize this, the, the, the chamber? Yeah. They don't do that until a year and a half later. Oh, no, it can be done. It can be done. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, preferably happens before January 3rd. Yeah. But, um, but who am I to give hiring advice to corporate executives who want to <laughs> and, help flip the house? And who are they? Uh, and who are they to listen to you is another good yeah, question. <laughs> Uh, in a okay, so let's assume that we do have a Republican House come January 3rd. You know, one thing I think we need to do a lot between now and January 3rd is sound the sirens on Social Security. Um, you know, similar to abortion, where people thought, oh, that'll never get taken away. Well, they want to cut Social Security, and they want to use any piece of leverage, including the debt ceiling, which will put our entire economy into collapse if we don't raise it, um, you know, on the table yep. in order to get cuts to Social Security. And if they have to fall back from Social Security, they want to cut other things that directly help people and keep millions of kids out of poverty, uh, millions of parents out of poverty. And I think, so we, and I think that, I, I, and I don't think it's the skies. I don't think it's. It was almost my prediction, personally, that yeah. they'll threaten debt ceiling in order to try to wipe away some of the climate change stuff that was passed uh, in yeah. the in the Inflation okay. Reduction Act. Yeah. So this is uh, just going a little wonky for a second. As of now, the debt ceiling we're good until about August. But we kind of know that we're handing Republicans a loaded gun going to this new Congress if we do not further raise the debt ceiling. And what people are basically saying is, let's extend it through the end of 2024. Let's not let them have any leverage, because the last time they had such leverage with President Obama, yep. they had extreme austerity that they were able to pass. It wasn't Social Security. You know, they were, we were able to get that off the table, but many, many good things got cut just because we were jammed. So we need to you know, sound the siren on Social Security, make clear those are the stakes, and put pressure on Democrats to raise debt ceiling in the lame Congress while we have power. Adam Green, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for your expertise. And thanks for your work on secretaries of state races, focusing not just on national politics, probably how we get this stuff done over time. Appreciate you.